today we're going to talk about a situation that is important to me personally, but it also has ramifications for both the immediate term uh, and the long term, uh, and it's going to have ripple effects for decades and centuries to come, and that is just the absolute state of the United States military with a specific emphasis on the unfolding and simmering, now almost you know erupting recruiting crisis that's happening in our military. And it boils down to this, and I want everyone to listen up, turn up the volume, because this is the bottom line. On our current trajectory, the United States of America is going to lose a major war. Not just a war of containment like Korea or Vietnam or a war of retribution or nation building like Afghanistan and Iraq. I'm talking about a major war against a peer power with millions of American casualties. No exaggeration. It's something that this country really hasn't experienced in its history, losing a major war. But that is the trajectory we are on if we don't reverse it, if it can be reversed. Okay? It brings me, no, it gives me no pleasure to say this, but it's the truth. And there is nothing more soul crushing to a nation than military defeat. Number one's military defeat. Number two is hyperinflation. We're, we're, we're probably on our way to that as well. But nothing is more devastating to the soul of a nation than serious military defeat. And that's, that, that's where we're headed if we don't change things rapidly. And, you know, I, I hear a lot of, there's a lot of people out there who are, are starting to come around to this idea. And unfortunately, there are too many in Congress, in both parties, who simply think that the solution is to throw money at this problem. Okay, I, I want to address this right out of the gate. The military does not have a funding problem. Okay, we spend over $800 billion a year on defense. The military does not have a funding problem. We have a culture problem. We have a leadership problem. And those are much more fundamental and serious than a funding problem. Okay, we've already been like, like here's, here's how much money we spend on defense and, and foreign aid, which is you know, an element of foreign policy. I mean, we've already given more money to Ukraine in inflation-adjusted terms than we spent in the entirety of the mid-20th century in the Marshall Plan, rebuilding Western Europe. We've already overspent that in Ukraine. And of course, we overspent that in Iraq and Afghanistan. So it's not, I mean, we have, like, for now, we have control over the money printer. So funding is not the issue, it, but it's, it's a much more deep and insidious issue, which is culture and leadership. Think about it this way. Could you, could you even imagine leaders like George Patton or General Douglas MacArthur or Admiral Bull Halsey in the modern military? Could you even imagine that today? No, because leaders like that, they wouldn't make it to the senior ranks. You know, they, they would either get out of the military early in their career, or they would be escorted out of the military uh, towards the middle of their career, because you know th those aren't the type of leaders that we promote and recruit and, and, and support. It's an intentional decision to not have leaders like that in our military. And, and no one, I mean, even people who defend the military today, you know, just, just regardless of everything, they really don't have an answer to that. Because it's just laughable to think of the modern military having a dynamic, outspoken, controversial leader like those three World War II era generals and admirals that I just mentioned. And so why do I, you know, why do I care about this? Well, I mean, I care about this because it's important for the country and the world, but you know, I'm a veteran. I mean, I, I spent just under four years in the army on active duty. Um, and in terms of recruiting, you know, I was, I was a military recruit. I don't come from a military family. Um, you know, no one in my immediate family, um, you know, has, has military service in their background. Um, and I went through the officer candidate school program. I went through basic training, officer candidate school, uh, the infantry officers course, ranger school before going to the 101st airborne in Iraq. So, you know, I, I've got a little bit of experience with, the recruiting process, and I, you know, I kind of obviously understand what it means to be a young man who, um, you know, feels compelled and desires military service in this country. And you know, I talk about this every single day 
with my friends who are still in the service on active duty, uh, my friends who are like me, who are veterans, um, who are in the private sector, who are outside. Um, and, and I talk to military families of, of all ages and all generations because everyone is kind of understanding the process that I'm going to lay out for you today. And of course, I mean, I, I speak about this because, you know, this is, this is of the utmost importance, um, you know, for the national security of the United States. And before I really get into recruiting, I want to address some of the big news this week. Uh, on Wednesday, a Marine sniper, Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews, testified in Congress. Now, I want everyone to go online and look at, or on social media and watch this Marine's testimony. It, it was heartbreaking. You know, this is, this is a Marine sniper who was critically wounded during the suicide bomber in the midst of the botched Afghanistan withdrawal. Um, you know, he is, like I said, he's critically wounded. He's, I believe, a double amputee. And even more heartbreaking and poignant about this entire story surrounding this Marine is that his, as a sniper, he and his sniper team had an opportunity to eliminate the suicide bomber before the bombing. Okay, in the days preceding the suicide bombing, they had positive ID on this suicide bomber on the scene. And they say, hey, sir, you know, this is the guy. Do we have authorization to shoot? And the battalion commander said, no. He said, I don't know. Um, you know, let me go check. Essentially, I'm not really in charge. And long story short, they never got the authorization. The suicide bomber escaped. And 13 American servicemen and countless more are dead and wounded because of it. I'm sick of this. Like, nothing illustrates the pathetic state of our national security apparatus than this incident right here. We've got a red-blooded American patriot, this Marine sniper, okay, who has trained his butt off for years. You know, to, to be a Marine sniper, I mean, this is something you've wanted, you've wanted to do for your entire life, most likely. He's trained for this. He's dedicated his life for this, defending this country. He's put himself in harm's way. He's ready to do his job. But he's got to check with his boss first, and his boss says no. Because his boss isn't in charge. Okay? And, and, and Americans are dead because of it. I've seen this play out in Iraq. Okay? When I was in Iraq in 2019. You know, and, and, and you know, look, my it, it wasn't really the fault of the battalion commander that I had in Iraq. He was actually quite aggressive when he was giving authorization for airstrikes. But I observed this personally. It wasn't even really his call. Okay, the person who had who had ultimate authority to green light airstrikes and 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 you know uh, lethal action were the lawyers in Baghdad at what we called U three Union three, you know, in the green zone in Iraq. You know, we're all watching the same feed from the tactical operating center, and you know, my battalion commander, yeah, he's you know, he says, yeah, let's go ahead and shoot. But it wasn't, it wasn't up to him to give final authorization. It was the lawyers. And I guarantee you it was a similar situation with this Marine sniper, okay, with Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews. I guarantee you the battalion commander, he, he, I mean, he, he probably, you know, I, I'm not going to speak for this clown, but he probably would, it, all other things being equal, he would have said, yeah, take the shot. But he knew that his career would be on the line if he didn't go through the proper channels. Okay, and that's, that's really what it's all about. For a lot of military officers above a certain rank, it's all about the career. And I'll get into this later. But, you know, these, these are guys, you know, just like any other corporate bureauc bureaucrats, you've invested 10, 15 years into a giant corporation. You know, do you really want to stick your neck out too far? and risk your career trajectory? You know, do you want to risk being fired? 
you know, like, cause you know, doing the right thing, especially against the wishes of the regime, you know, that could get you in trouble that could jeopardize your next evaluation or your next promotion. That's how it works. That's the system that we have created. Okay. So that, that, that testimony, again, I encourage everyone to go watch that. It was infuriating. It was heartbreaking. But that is the complete and utter state in a perfect illustration of where we are as a country and as a military specifically. And so one of the main issues that we have in the military is recruiting. And here are some of the basic facts. You know, hat tip to Christina Wong over at Breitbart. You know, she's give her a follow on give her a follow on Twitter. She's done some fantastic reporting about the state of the military over the years. She's over at Breitbart, Christina Wong. So here are the facts. Beginning in early 2022, th this, this recruiting crisis started to break out into the mainstream. The Army has already admitted last year that in fiscal year 2022, they only hit 40% of their recruiting goal. Okay? I mean, 40% of their enlisted recruiting goal. It's so bad that, they, that the Army has already had to reduce the size of the force because of this recruiting crisis. That's the first time in history, in the history of the Army, that because of bad recruiting, they've had to reduce the size of the force. An internal DOD survey revealed that only 9% of young Americans who are eligible to serve in the military have any interest in doing so at all. So of the very small percentage, you know, probably like 1% one, one or 2% or less of young Americans who are physically eligible for military service, only 9% of that 1% have any desire to serve in the military. And, you know, more of these internal reports cited by Christina Wong indicate that the military is considering dropping even more of its medical disqualifiers, like asthma. Okay, like, you know, the military has a lot of conditions, uh, medical conditions, that will preclude you from military service. Recruiting is so bad that they're going to drop these. And they're also ramping up their efforts to get illegal immigrants to serve in the military. The Dreamers, uh, you know, illegal immigrants into uniform to fight for their new country. You know, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's one way we can finally secure the border is, you know, impress more illegal immigrants into military service. You know, I, I'm halfway kidding, but that's what the military is doing right now. So these are the facts. Th those are the facts of the current state of the military in terms of recruiting. And so I guess the more interesting question as this breaks into the public conscience, you know, how do we fix this? And, you know, my good friend Bowtie Ranger on Twitter, give him a Twitter follow as well. He's an Army veteran like me. You know, he had, he had three pretty good explanations for why this is happening, and I, I generally agree. And, you know, number one, people don't want to die for this regime's neoliberal agenda. Okay, I mean, like, just think about Iraq and Afghanistan, nation building. Okay, and, and I can just, I can tell you firsthand in Iraq. I mean, one of the, one of the biggest red pills that I ever took was, was deploying to Iraq. I, I wish every American had the ability to at least see what one of these war-torn third world countries is like, okay, on the ground. And, you know, I was always, you know, you know, I, I was against the, you know, the, the nation building concept even before I deployed. Like, I, I readily admit that. But my deployment really made me angry because, I mean, within a week of being over there, it was evident to anyone with a brain that this country has no chance of sustain. I mean, this country, I, I say country in air quotes, this, this area, th this conglomeration of, of, ethnic and religious, you know, civil war for centuries, this area has zero chance of becoming a, you know, Jeffersonian parliamentary democracy, you know, like, like the elites and the neocons believed it would be, you know, if we just, you know, if we just liberated the Iraqis, you know, if we got rid of Saddam Hussein, then, and, you know, like, you know, expanded the franchise and just, you know, introduced this, this new flowering of democracy. Let people vote. 
then yeah, this would, you know, this would be like, like the founding of America, right? You need to, everyone remembers those days, you know, it, you know, in the, in the, you know, Oh, three, Oh, four, you know, once Saddam was removed, everyone, Oh, you know, remember the, the photos of, you know, women holding up their purple fingers cause they were voting and Oh, you know, Condi Rice is, you know, Iraq is sovereign. Oh my, this is just great. I mean, you have to be an idiot. Okay. There's really two explanations. You're either an evil manipulative, you know, neocon or number two, you're just an, an idiot. Okay, those are the only two explanations for why you think that type of government is possible in a nation that does not have the foundation of a civil society. Okay, but that's what our betters believe would happen in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, you know, it, it's just, it's appalling to me that, I mean, like, like that's the level of competence, either evil or incompetence we have in our government. They truly think that, you know, the, the American way of life, the American system of government, you know, the West, Western civilization is possible in places that don't have a certain set of preconditions already in place. You know, what I would call a civil society. Okay. It, it's like democracy does not yield a civil society. A civil society yields a democracy, a constitutional republic. Okay. And, and you know, look, we're losing that. We've lost that here in America, but I'm saying like the America at the founding had that civil society. And so a constitutional republic was possible. Iraq and Afghanistan and, you know, Ukraine, they don't have that civil society. They don't have that certain set of preconditions. So it's not going to work. But we continue to try to jam this square peg into a round hole. We can't want it for them more than they want it for themselves. That's the bottom line. And look, I knew that before I got to Iraq, but it, it really made it, even more clear, even more poignant, and even more painful for me as a soldier to see that this is what so many Americans had fought and died for. I'm not some kind of a, you know, hippie pacifist. In a perfect world, I want a robust and strong American military, but I wanted to protect our interests. Okay. And I sent out a tweet a few weeks ago asking this rhetorical question, you know, of all the things that the neocons and neolibs have, you know, ha have promoted in terms of American foreign military intervention, which is everywhere. You know, like, like there, there's no project they would disagree with, you know, no foreign country, they would say no to bombing, um, you know, no, you know, coup that they would not support engineering, except for, you know, except for one, there, there's one major exception in my mind, and that is the Southern border. Why has no one in the DC intelligentsia really ever proposed, you know, using a massive military operation to once and for all destroy the Mexican drug cartels and secure our southern border? Why has no one ever proposed that? Okay, like why did no one? Why has no one ever proposed, you know, liberating Canada? from the clutches of their evil regime, the Trudeau regime. We saw what happened with the Canadian truckers. Look, I'm not saying we should do these things. I mean, I think, I mean, obviously our military leadership is incompetent. Okay. And, 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 you know, an invasion of Mexico or an invasion of Canada under the current leadership would surely yield a disaster. I'm just saying, I think it's a, it's a, it's a tell the dog didn't bark. Why haven't they proposed these ideas? Okay. Because these, these ideas are directly in the American interest. Okay, securing our borders, making sure that the North American landmass is secure. Okay, the, the ultimate expression of manifest destiny. Okay, but we, we, we don't hear those things. It's all, about, it's all about somewhere else. It's all about something that, you know, like it, at first glance, with an honest evaluation, is not in the American interest. Okay, so that's number one. Okay, that, that people don't want to die for the regime's neoliberalism. But number two is that the military is woke and it no longer exemplifies peak masculine culture. Yes, I said it, peak masculine culture. Any military worth its salt historically, okay, like I don't, I don't judge my views based on the current thing, okay? I judge my views based on what God says, what history says, and what tradition yields. 
And yes, a functional military, a robust military is going to exemplify peak masculine culture. We don't have that anymore. Okay, I, I read a great book a number of years ago by a man named James Hassan, a young man who also happened to be a, an infantry officer. It was called Stand Down, and he wrote about the revolution. It was not started by the Obama administration, but it was really completed by the Obama administration. The woke revolution, the left-wing revolution, the cultural revolution, the great leap forward that had happened in the American military over the years, but particularly completed in the Obama administration. Okay, like, here's, here, here's the facts. The military, you know, it's multiple millions of service members. I, you know, I say servicemen, you know, I, I hate the term service members, okay? Like servicemen. It, it's just, it's, it's been used for a century, servicemen. The military is made up, truly, of less than 50,000 true warriors, okay? I'm talking about, you know, really solid infantry personnel. I'm talking about special operations, um, you know, combat arms, you know, real, real trigger pullers, okay? And there's less than 50,000 of them, in my estimation. The millions of other jobs are, are really, I mean, they're not, I mean, like, obviously many of them have a military function, but a lot of them are, are, operate, are, are operate and are governed not unlike any other giant corporation HR type of a situation, okay? I mean, like, the military is a very small nucleus of real warriors with this giant apparatus of, you know, what we would call support or just the, the, the ancillary jobs, okay? And so, you know, there's, like, when you think of the military, you think of, like, SEAL Team 6, like, yeah, those people are in the military, but that is a very tiny minority of what the force really is. You know, the military is, you know, they're, they're protective of that nucleus because, you know, they really can't escape the reality that those are, you know, those are the real people who are protecting this nation and are executing, you know, our foreign policy, such as it is. But the rest of the military, it's just kind of like everything else. It's like a college campus. It's a, it's a woke, you know, industrial complex uh, mechanism, you know, you, you've got people who, um, you know, are, are, you know, like kind of copying, copying and pasting the same HR slides, uh, you know, DEI initiative slides that you would see at, you know, some, some bank in New York city or, you know, some consulting firm, the same thing is happening in the military. Okay. And, you know, a lot of that, you know, as James, James Hassan identifies, particularly in stand down, um, you know, the Obama administration, you know, made it a, a you know serious objective to you know to to artificially kind of astroturf you know the 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 masculine elements of the military with non-masculine elements of the military okay the the woke ideology in the military okay so when you're talking about infantry units okay now you know you're you're forced to have women in these infantry units okay that's a problem you know like you know I'll I, I I've always said this publicly and privately that introducing females into combat units is a disaster. Okay. Because you're introducing an element that is just simply not compatible with the, you know, the, the, the highest level of lethality for the unit. Okay. And that's, that's, that's probably a subject for a deeper podcast on that issue specifically, but you know, that's, that's just one example of, you know, how the, the, the leadership structure, the political and, you know, upper echelons of the military, the leadership structure, you know, the, the, the DC structure of the military have, you know, made adjustments to the force that are not compatible with the highest level of performance of the military. And that's really what it is, like, like bottom line. Every single decision that's made in the military should be made based on what makes the military most effective. And like ultimately, that's the, like over the past, you know, 50, 60 years, many decisions had been made that did not have that in mind. They were made with a political ideology in mind. Okay, so that's number two. And then number three, you know, the elephant in the room for the past several years is the vaccine mandates. Okay, I mean, like, the vaccine mandates exposed for everyone to see how little the regime really cares about, about servicemen. You know, like, I mean, like, they're, they're, we're talking about the military, especially that, you know, like, hardcore group of trigger pullers. I mean, these are, I mean, like, especially that group, I mean, I've played, 
football at a very high level, you know, in the SEC in college and with the New England Patriots in the NFL. Okay, like these elite level military personnel are not unlike professional athletes. Okay, like they don't get paid like professional athletes, but in terms of athleticism, in terms of their training regiment, uh, regimen, diet, you know, nutrition, I mean, everything, um, and the amount of money that is spent on their training. I mean, these are basically professional athletes. Okay, this is a young and healthy demographic. These people never needed the vaccine. Okay, they never needed it. But, of course, it was applied to them just like it was applied to young people all over the country by woke corporate HR band-aids. And, you know, everyone knew that these, this demographic of the military didn't need the vaccine. Everyone knew that from day one. But it was imposed upon them. And when these side effects and adverse events, you know, first became evident, and, you know, Senator Ron Johnson has been a warrior for this, um, you know, he, he's had some very brave whistleblowers come forth in a Senate testimony that haven't gotten a lot of coverage, but it's there. You can look it up. There have been, you know, standards of deviations, higher levels of adverse events in the military due to the vaccine. And of course, that's all swept under the rug because, you know, the regime doesn't really care about the well-being of the force. They care about imposing their agenda upon the force and, and using the force to impose their agenda upon everyone else. OK, and you know, like I'm no, I'm no Johnny come lately to this. OK, everyone you know, like the Republicans were were, were back slapping themselves over getting the vaccine mandate taken out of the NDAA for 2023. OK, for fiscal year 2023. But that was already too late. You know, when it wasn't too late the year before that, you know, getting the vaccine mandate out of the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2022. And in December of 2021, that was a lonely fight. I know because I was there. I went on Fox Business in December of 2021 when, when hardly anyone else would. And I said, hey, every U.S. senator, I was running for a senator at the time, every U.S. senator should vote against the 2022 NDAA because that includes the vaccine mandate. Okay. And like, like at the time, that was a radical position. You know, even like, like people on the right were, you know, thought that was, thought that was too radical, but of course it was correct. And so fast forward a year later, after thousands of servicemen have been fired from their jobs and many more vaccine injured, okay, injured, negative side effects from the vaccine. Now, you know, everyone wants to congratulate themselves on the right for getting the vaccine mandate out of the NDAA. And it's not really out of the NDAA. I mean, it, it's, it's out for now, but the, the way it was worded, um, you know, theoretically gave some leeway for the Secretary of Defense or, you know, other bureaucrats to just simply reinsert it. I mean, it should be permanently gone. But it just, you know, it makes me sick because, you know, I, I identified the problem at the time, you know, when it would have mattered. You know, if we could have gotten the NDAA um, to get rid of the vaccine mandate in the fiscal year 2022, that would have made a difference. That would have saved many servicemen their jobs and their pensions, OK, and it would have prevented many adverse health outcomes. But again, the GOP, too little, too late. They're late to the fight. I'm glad they got it out of this year, of fiscal year 2023. But, you know, again, it wasn't the right fight at the right time. OK, so, you know, how do we fix this? I mean, and that's really that's really the, the, the ultimate question. Like, OK, I've laid out the, the, the problems or just a, a very, um, you know, a, a very big picture overview so where do we go from here? And I mean, this is the this is the problem that I addressed in the first podcast. We really can't fix the current system. I mean, like e even having a Republican president doesn't really doesn't really change the status quo. I mean, we had a Republican president under Trump, and I mean, we still had you know we had high level military officers knifing him in the back. Um, you know, we had people like Alexander Vindman on the National Security Council you know, leaking to the press and, you know, like, like the deep state apparatus, um, trying to get rid of him. I mean, like you had, you know, the chairman of the joint chiefs, Mark Milley openly committing treason after January 6th, you know, saying that, Hey, like we're about to get rid of this guy. I mean, talking to his Chinese counterpart saying, Hey, um, you know, like despite what Trump says, even if he orders military action against China, don't worry. Um, you know, the military is not going to obey those orders that actually happened. And of course, Mark Milley still has a job. I mean, that like like that is the level of corruption and how deep the problem goes. I mean, if you wanted to even begin 
to fix this problem within the current structure, you would have to fire every single officer above 05, okay? That's colonel or higher in the Army and the Marines, and I believe that's captain or higher in, in the Navy. I mean, like, essentially every flag officer would have to go. Because, and I'm not like, oh, Jake, like, you know, I, my colonel, my, you know, brigadier general was a great guy. I'm not saying there's not exceptions. I'm saying that by and large, to get to that position in the modern military, you have to sell out or at least keep your mouth shut. Okay. It goes back to the very beginning point that I made, like, like Douglas MacArthur and George Patton, they don't make it to general in the modern military. They just don't. They get out at a young age or they're forced out like Colonel Douglas McGregor was. Okay, they force him out and, and steal all of his ideas. Okay, so you would have to essentially fire and replace every single officer of flag rank. Okay, you would have to gut the National Security Council. And that would never happen. I mean, that wouldn't happen w without just a, a massive reaction. Um, and, and, you know, like, I, I, you know, obviously Trump, you know, he had the opportunity to, to embark upon that process. I mean, it really, you know, the, the, the military deep state really, you know, still knifed him in the back. So, you know, I, I don't see him or any other Republican president really fixing that problem. You know, maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, that's really what you would have to do. I mean, re like, really what you have to do, well, like the process that has to be embarked upon, okay, these, these Republican governors in red states, in deep red states, they have to step up, okay, on a lot of issues, okay, but particularly on this issue, it's not going to get you a lot of coverage, pr probably on a lot of conservative networks, but... Um, you know, I think that Republican governors in deep red states have to beef up their state guard units. Okay. They need to create, and you know, Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida has somewhat begun this process. You need to create a separate state guard, essentially a state militia that is not subject to us to federal assumption under title 10. Okay. Like that's essentially the hook in federal law that allows the federal government to take control over state national guard units. Um, you know, whenever the federal government, um, you know, deems it necessary or prudent. Okay, like that, that's how many state National Guardsmen, um, you know, are deployed to the Middle East or wherever. Okay, but in many state constitutions, especially in red states, there is a provision that allows the governor to create, to create a new military force, like a state guard or a state militia, that is not subject to that Title X. Okay, that really is under the command of re Republican governors. Okay, so like what I would do in that situation as a, as a red state governor in a deep red state, I would create a state guard and I would essentially, you know, like I, I would fund it very heavily. You know, I would beef up its equipment, its training, um, you know, the amenities, I mean, everything. I would make this a point of emphasis in my state and I would send out a massive recruiting call for all people who are true warriors in our military true warriors in law enforcement, true warriors in border patrol, true warriors in civilian life. I would say come to Arkansas or wherever red state, okay, and serve in my force, okay? You're going to be treated with respect. There's not going to be any vaccine mandate. There's going to be peak masculine culture, okay? Like we're, we're essentially going to create our own military unit that is the tip of the spear relative to you know, the, the, the current American military and even the historical military units. We're going to create an elite state guard, okay? And we're going to bring in the best trainers. We're going to have the best equipment. And we're going to be lethal. We're going to be high performing. We're going to secure our state border, okay? We're going to deport illegal immigrants from, from, from our state, okay? We are going to have, we are going to have the ability to defend ourselves from all threats, foreign and domestic, okay? That is the ideal situation. Red state governors need to get on the ball and start doing this. Because obviously, I mean, just like think about it this way practically. Imagine if we had five or six deep red states with real red state governors who believed in this and who did it. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but it could happen in the next five to ten years. Okay, we create five or six high-functioning state guard units, Okay, if you want to secure the border, then we secure the border. Obviously, the federal government's not going to do it. You know, over the past 40 years, they have utterly refused to secure the border. Okay, I mean, obviously, they're violating the Constitution. They're, they're not doing their duty under the Constitution in securing our border from invasion. But, like, okay, like, like everyone knows that. That's not going to change their mind. That's not going to change their attitude. 
Okay, even Trump sent some units to the border. You know, like when I was in Iraq, um, a, a sister brigade in the 101st Airborne was deployed at the southern border. Okay, and that's not just a pie in the sky fantasy. You know, it's doable with the right leadership, with the right funding, with the right recruiting message. I think this could be a very attractive solution. But, you know, it's a project. It's a project for the future. You know, because look, I mean, the federal government, you know, is, is you know, for all intents and purposes, is lost. Red states, red counties, red districts. Okay, get the right leaders into those positions. Okay, and, and that's really, that's my number one, you know, immediate or intermediate and long-term solution for, for this issue. So, you know, there's, there's my state of the U.S. military with an emphasis on recruiting. I'm not just going to give you complaints. I'm going to give you potential solutions. But for those of you who have not served uh, in the military or don't have many military members in your family, you might not be aware of this issue. So I wanted to lay it out for those who are not thinking about this issue every single day. It's a problem that you know a lot of us who, who, who have worn the uniform have identified. Um, it's an existential threat, not just to our government, but you know to our prospects worldwide. Um, so it's a serious issue. I hope you were informed by this podcast. Uh, like this podcast, subscribe to it. We're on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Share this thing around. Give us a five-star review. And I can't wait to be with you again next week for episode three. God bless. Mm -hmm.